Hey, welcome back. Time to finish what we started. If you're just joining us, what are you doing? This is part two. I have kept the titles and numbering for these videos very simple because that is what Kingdom Hearts fans crave. But if you're just interested in hearing about the cream of the crop, I'll give you a quick recap. In part one, we went over number 15 through 9, that is Atlantica, Disney Castle, 100 Acre Wood, Pride Lands, Port Royal, Land of Dragons, and Agrabah in that order. I think this project has been delayed long enough, so let's just get right into number 8. Get it memorized. I want to get my life to a place where my house is so big it separates from this earth entirely and just constitutes as its own planet. Beast Castle. Is the world flat, or does walking out the front gate just put you in the backyard? In the physical sense, Beast Castle most reminds me of Neverland from KH1 and that it's a very contained and consistent world space and ultimately a bit underwhelming. Not that the small town in Beauty and the Beast is super memorable or relevant to the story being told here, but it does feel a bit claustrophobic having the whole world take place inside a castle that ultimately isn't that big. Beauty and the Beast is another movie I had not seen in its entirety prior to playing Cage 2, but when I watched it in full I was especially struck by the ending sequence with Beast and Gaston on the rooftops and spires of the castle, which I think could have been a fun environment to incorporate into this world. With the stripping away of the town setting comes the absence of major characters, namely Maurice and Gaston, although I'm aware they later do appear in the mobile game. Notably, this is the first time a Disney World has completely excluded the source material's villain. I mean, I guess there's Monstro, but Monstro itself is kind of a villain. Regardless, I always thought this was kind of odd, and I never really understood why Gaston's not here, although I'm trying to picture what his Cage 2 model would look like, and it's just not coming out quite right, so maybe that's it. My best guess is that they didn't really know how to handle a villain who's typically played for laughs and weave that type of personality into the story they're trying to tell here, but I really don't know. Instead, the role of antagonist in Beast Castle is filled by Zaldan, which leads me to my biggest point of praise for this world. I've kind of been sleeping on how Beast Castle, at least relative to most of the rest of the game, makes an effort to intertwine the Disney stuff with Kingdom Hearts' original plot elements. In doing so, the world isn't forced to strictly follow the story beats of the film while still staying true to the general plot and character development in the source material. In Cage 1, we saw that Beast clearly cared about Belle enough to, like, swim through outer space to rescue her, so we're already a ways into their relationship by the time Sora arrives in Beast Castle. Bringing in Zaldan to essentially gaslight and manipulate Beast into thinking Belle is against him works as a way to dial that relationship back and stretch out the process of the conflict resolution just a bit longer. I will say, I always found it kind of odd and maybe a bit lazy when the villains just spend a lot of time focusing on one character and fantasizing about turning them into a heartless and or nobody. Like, is this really the best usage of the organization's resources, sending one of their, at this point, six loyal operatives to harass one guy in hopes of getting, like, a strongish mook foot soldier out of it? The same goes for Pete with Jafar and Scar or Maleficent with Santa Claus. Again, let's aim higher, people. I have a feeling Sora could dispatch a Santa Claus heartless fairly quickly. Nitpick about the motivation aside, Zaldan's meddling in this world is the type of stuff I wish the game attempted more often. Again, the reasoning needs some work, and Zaldan is potentially the blandest character in the series, and he exists in the same series as Lexius, but this is all still better than just watching a condensed Beauty and the Beast in PS2 graphics. Plus, you know, Belle elbowing Zaldan in the stomach is an all-timer moment. That's like the forefather of Woody v. Xehanor, Jack v. Luxord, and Sully v. Vanitas. Zaldan manipulating Beast also creates the opportunity for conflict between not just Beast and Belle, but Beast and the party, too. If you thought Peter Pan back in Cage 1 was kind of a dick, try having a straight-up mini-boss battle against someone who's supposed to be on your side. It's not a very hard fight at all, but I'm always down for solving a problem with violence instead of talking things out. While we're not engaged in friendly fire in this world, I'm a big fan of the Heartless designs introduced here as well. The Gargoyle Heartless are especially cohesive with the world's theming, and they're like the closest thing to a jump scare you're gonna get in a Kingdom Hearts game, with how they just burst out of the scenery, unlike how any other Heartless just spawn in. Likewise, the Dark Thorn is potentially the scariest looking Heartless up to this point in the series. Like this thing? Yeah, that's from Unova. The Dark Thorn? He's from Hell. He's like a crossbreed of Darkseid and Stealth Sneak, and I actually just found out he's based on Ifrit's design from Final Fantasy X, which I can definitely see now. There's something else out there that was strong enough to put chains on the Dark Thorn, and whatever that thing was is now certainly dead. Speaking of things that die here, Zaldan. I wasn't too surprised that we ended up fighting him here, but I was definitely taken aback as a kid when he just... he just dies. Again, Beast Castle does a bit of precedence breaking, at least as far as Cage 2 goes, but I wasn't expecting to lose one of the KH original villains here, especially after Demix made it out of the first Olympus visit alive. And as far as I'm aware, Zaldan is generally considered one of the harder story bosses, and one of the few in the game that could be considered a roadblock for some players. I know I had a decent amount of trouble with him as a kid. And the whole time I was fighting him, I thought, geez, if this is hard, I could only imagine just how much of a pain in the ass he's gonna be when we have to fight him again in that big, edgy castle. But alas, Zaldan would meet his end at this big, edgy castle, and a Disney one at that. Kind of demeaning, really. Of course, my younger self was not a true fan and was playing on a sad, soggy English cage too, the least final of mixes, and thus there was no data Zaldan to dread fighting at a later date. This was the end of the road for our mutton-chopped cardboard cutout of a man, a tale as old as time. 
got it memorized? You know, I realized as I was writing my list for KH1 in my earliest playthroughs of that game, I never even noticed that Halloween Town was, well, just Halloween Town. The movie is The Nightmare Before Christmas, but in KH1, it's really just The Nightmare Before. I totally glossed over it in that list, but how strange for a world to kind of just ignore literally half of its source material. So what a natural follow-up and remedy to this problem that KH2 presents. In retrospect, I guess KH1's version of the world takes place prior to the events of the movie, albeit still culminating in the killing of walking, talking, sack of shit Oogie Boogie. KH2's iteration of the world is much closer to following the general plot of the movie, which I'm normally not a huge fan of, but the introduction of such a large chunk of the source material after after its absence in the first game, goes a long way in spicing up Sora's return to the locale. But yes, Christmas Town is the top story here, and I actually completely forgot that in the original release, Halloween Town and Christmas Town share the same music tracks, and Sora, Donald, and Goofy retain their Halloween-themed costumes. So Final Mix definitely gains the world some points for amending that with the two new tracks and Christmas outfits for the trio, which are, as usual, super charming. I love when they go the extra mile with these types of things. I should say, I'm a huge Christmas stan, I mean, secularly at least, getting stuff given stuff, nostalgic TV and music, what's not to like? So naturally, the combination of my favorite holiday and favorite game series gives me a bit of a soft spot for Halloween Town in this game. Which, I guess that's another world misnomer, considering half of the world is not Halloween Town. Judging by the doors to all the other worlds and hinterlands, maybe the nexus of all holidays would be a more fitting world name, but perhaps not as catchy. I know I said in the beginning of part one that I didn't want to harp on the hang-ups I have with KH2's world design, but I have to make an exception here. Despite its relatively high placement, I find KH2 Halloween Town's level design to be just totally abysmal. It's potentially my least favorite in any of the main games. It's a hallway from Dr. Fink's lab to Santa's workshop, and it has two detours, both of which are rooms solely created for boss fights, with no other utility beyond those encounters. If I wasn't such a sucker for the Halloween and Christmas aesthetics, this world would assuredly be much further down the list. While it's definitely not as interesting or consequential as Zaldan and Beast Castle, I do appreciate getting the Maleficent and Oogie Boogie reunion in this world. Anytime we get to see characters from two different sources playing off of each other, I'm all about it. That's the mission statement of the series, after all. Of course, on one hand, it's fun to finally see an attempt at rebuilding the villain coalition and doing a bit of a throwback to the KH1 days, but on the other, what are we doing here, guys? I referenced this with Jafar back in part one, but look at yourselves. What are you doing? You were very close to unlocking the secrets of the universe and gaining total control, and now you're bullying Santa Claus. Like, this is potentially the most washed up Maleficent ever looks in the series, and that's kind of saying a lot because she's basically always looked pretty washed up since, you know... It is pretty fun that Oogie just ends up being totally insubordinate and frankly very ungrateful after being literally brought back to life. Up till then, Maleficent's lackeys have been at best totally faithful and at worst bumbling but well-meaning, so it's definitely amusing for one of her subordinates to just be like, thanks for the assist lady, but you're on my home turf, so why don't you scram? And after said scramming is one of my favorite Cage 2 boss fights, of which I think the mechanics are well set up and explained by the little Donald cutscene prior to the battle. It's also consistent with Oogie's Cage 1 boss fight, as both of these encounters feature him being a gigantic coward and hiding up and out of reach until you can thwart whatever machine he's using against you to either reach his level or bring him down to yours and then just beat the piss out of him. It's also just fun that the fight very much puts you on the antagonist's terms. It's different from another boring, circular arena without any obstacles. Almost every boss fight has its gimmicks, sure, but this one really makes use of its environment, which is an appreciation shake up. As far as other Halloween Town bosses go, there's the experiment, which I'm less interested in when it comes to combat and more so regarding its story significance. Once again, I think it's another natural progression for this world after Cage 1, building off of the idea of creating an artificial heart. This time, we have something that exists with seemingly everything but a heart, and it spends its entire existence searching for one at any cost, including sacrificing the welfare of others, which, if anything, serves as a parallel to the organization's goal in this game. And not unlike the organization, Sora cuts the experiment down, and I still can't help but feel kind of bad for both of them, even though I probably totally shouldn't. It's especially unsettling in the case of the experiment because it's literally just like a newly born mute monstrosity and it's trying to piece together the concept of what it means to have a heart. It somehow managed to surmise that, oh, if presents make people happy, if giving a present is sharing part of yourself and your heart with another, maybe if I hoard these presents I can have that same feeling, I can have a heart. But he was wrong, and they killed him for it. This wasn't just an animalistic being of concentrated evil, it was some sort of unfortunate creation trying to find its place in the world, which, relatable, am I right? I should also note, while the experiment plot is entirely confined to the second visit, there's a nice bit of continuity, as you can see Dr. Finkelstein working on it during your first trip to the world. So I like that through line there, however small it may be. As always, Halloween Town is just rife with observations that make for subpar points of analysis, but at least replacement level, if somewhat lazy comedy bits. Sora, Donald, Goofy, and Riku are all accounted for on Santa's list, 
exist, so is this Santa responsible for delivering presents to not just his entire world, but every world? How does Santa see people when they're sleeping and know when they're awake, even knowing that Riku told Sora that Santa Claus is bullshit when he was seven, but not know where Riku is when Sora asks? I mean, what a phony. Does the existence of a Christmas town canonize Jesus Christ in the Kingdom Hearts universe? What world would he have lived in? Is there a New Testament-themed world in Kingdom Hearts? Is Judas Iscariot a boss battle? Isn't Sora a bit old to be believing in Santa Claus at age 15? I mean, Donald and Goofy are like 71 and 73 here, so I guess I'm more concerned about them. Then again, Santa is real, so I guess I'm the dumbass here, but you didn't need to watch all the way to number 7 on the list to know that. Got it memorized? So, I've been struggling with severe Space Paranoid's Cognitive Dissonance Syndrome for much of my working relationship with KH2. Not long ago, I would have placed this world in the bottom half, and frankly towards the lower end of that half, but I did have to address some of my own hypocrisy and reevaluate where it stood for me. Basically, what I dislike about Space Paranoid's is pretty superficial, but the stuff I do like is ultimately of more consequence and importance to me when judging a world. Let me get my cons out of the way, and then we'll move on to the pros. I guess it's kind of shallow, but I just hate how this place looks. It's definitely unique and unlike anything we'd seen up to this point, but I don't know, the whole 80s computer hackery data aesthetic just doesn't really do it for me. And I know that might be controversial because I've seen a lot of people praise the world specifically for its aesthetics, but uh, different strokes, I guess. For me, the environments are all just kind of these blue, indistinguishable, and not super memorable spaces, and most of it looks practically unfinished. Which, I get that that's more so a design choice than an actual failing on the developer's part, but like, what is any of this? What am I walking on? What does any of this mean in the physical sense? Like, why should I care? It's all just like, data, computer, technology, neon digital somethings. Now admittedly, Tron is the only movie in either Cage 1 or 2 that I haven't seen, so maybe I'm just sorely missing some context and appreciation for the source material. Which, speaking of that, as far as making picks for a Kingdom Hearts world goes, Tron isn't just out of left field, it's like out of the ballpark. That's how comparatively obscure and unexpected this is. Again, maybe my own experience or lack thereof with the source material is coloring my perspective here, but I would have to think that at least half of players in 2005 and 6 had either not seen Tron or were just flat out not familiar with the property. And I'm willing to bet a considerable percentage of the players who were familiar with it were surprised to find out that it's a Disney movie. Time travel back to 2002, give your average Kingdom Hearts 1 player a sheet of paper with like 30 blank spaces and ask them to fill them in with movies they'd like or even expect to see adapted as worlds for the sequel. How many of them are putting down Tron? Of course, to harken back to my thoughts on world choices in KH1, being an oddball pick doesn't make it bad. In fact, I would have thought Fantasia would be the least adaptable movie for a Kingdom Hearts game, but it turns out I'm just nowhere near creative enough, and that's one of the best worlds in Dream Drop Distance. Spoilers for that inevitable list. But I guess Space Paranoids gives me the same feeling I get when Smash Bros gets a new character in the form of an anime swordsman instead of something more recognizable that people are clamoring for. It's like, oh man, you stole Treasure Planet's spot. I know that's not really how game development works, and it's more likely that Space Paranoids wasn't chosen over something else, the alternative to Space Paranoids is probably just not having it at all. And I'd rather have more game than less, at least if the game is generally good, so it's hard to complain too much about it. As I was analyzing all of the worlds for this project, I came to realize that maybe part of my early distaste for Space Paranoids derives from its placement in the game. I always found it especially annoying on my earlier replays of KH2 when I had finished off the first batch of Disney Worlds all excited for the crazy shit that happens in Hollow Bastion and then remembered, Ah, oh, right, I gotta do Space Paranoids first. I even felt that a bit on my first run when the party is ejected from the world partway through and you get some plot development back in Hollow Bastion and Mickey the goddamn mouse shows up after spending much of the series in the background up to this point. We start getting teases about how there are actually 43 different characters who are in, some not just one, and then... Ah, great. So on those early playthroughs, I was really just speeding and mashing through Space Paranoids to get back to the juicy Hollow Bastion stuff. Although, I will say... The light cycle is pretty sick. It's reminiscent of the Jungle Slider game from Deep Jungle and that the devs knew that this was absolutely the coolest and most memorable thing about the movie and they were gonna find a way to work it into the world no matter what. Admittedly, I just completely disregard whatever rock, paper, scissors thing they're going for here and just spam the tackle button because boy does it feel good to spam. But getting past all of my nitpicks, I have to admit that out of every Disney world in this game, Space Paranoids is making the most honest effort to be cohesive with the overarching Kingdom Hearts plot. The way the world manages to contextualize itself and its relation to a cage original world is basically unreplicated, and unlike any other Disney world in Cage 2, the consequences of what happens here actually extend to the outside world and story in a meaningful and tangible way. And I mean, it would be weird for Space Paranoids to be fashioned as its own entire planet like most worlds in Kingdom Hearts are, so it makes sense that it's contextualized as a computer program within another world. You're less than two minutes into the world and Tron is already dropping a hollow bastion on you which should give you a clue that this world is a bit different from anything we've seen so far. Not more than a few minutes later, Tron tells you that his user is the guy that you killed at the end of the last game. Even the music cuts out here, it's like, wait a minute, what the hell is going on? My user is the user of this system. Anson the Wise. 
It's fitting and perhaps intentional that we're using the least recognizable property in this game to deliver us the Disney characters who are most relevant to the main plot outside of the core trio. I wouldn't blame anyone for mistaking Tron and Sark as original Kingdom Hearts characters when they're equal parts obscure and well-written into the overarching narrative. Even KH1, which I've lauded in the past for its worlds that often contribute to the underlying themes and plot, never quite reached this level of seamless integration. The first game was definitely more consistent in this effort, but Space Paranoids is probably the peak in this regard even still. Outside of DGM and maybe a Yen Sid, you're never going to catch a Disney character not just saying the words Ansem or Hollow Bastion, but giving a shit about them and participating in a two-way street of relevancy between each other. On the first visit, the MCP, in a totally malevolent bid to just take over the world, I guess, tries to blow Hollow Bastion up, or at the very least send a Heartless from the data world into the real one to terrorize its residents. Later on, the MCP manages to take control of the Heartless Manufactory and even reprograms the Claymore defense mechanisms to attack Sora and company while they're out in the real world. You're just not getting this level of interplay with any other Disney world in really the series, and so I have to commend Space Paranoids for these efforts and give the world a huge amount of props for it. I've also gotta say, there's something so fun about Tron the character. After he and the party effortlessly beat the crap out of Sark, Sark pays Tron a seemingly sincere compliment, and Tron delivers one of my favorite one-liners in the game, I'm also better than you. In response, Sark, in what appears to be genuine anguish, laments that in another life, maybe he and Tron could have been teammates. Tron's reaction to this is throwing a disc thing at Sark's face, completely rocking his shit, and summarily murdering him. Then he turns to the remaining antagonist in this world and says, boy, this guy sure is ugly, let's kill him too. Like, is there any other party member in the game that displays this level of BDE? When he's not busy being a bit of a psychopath, Tron also undergoes a cute little arc throughout your two visits, softening up a bit and you know, doing Kingdom Heartsy stuff like learning the power of friendship. He expresses the lesson he's learned at the end of your second visit, which is kind of a mirror of Sora's speech toward the end of KH1. Here we've got two guys who have learned over time that their strength comes from their friends. It's nice. And then they hug, and Sora's like, I've never hugged a One World Party member before, this is weird. And then Tron kills himself. He doesn't fuck around. And then he restores the memories of an entire community and transforms the world name icon right before our very eyes. He's just that powerful. Got it memorized. Final fucking Fantasy 10. You know, I've been slowly revealing what my top 10 games are as I make videos on this channel, and I know all none of you are waiting with bated breath to see that list in its entirety, but here's the part where I unveil my number 3. Final Goddamn Fantasy 10. Obviously this video isn't about that game, but there will be somewhat moderate spoilers regarding a certain character's arc in that game, so hop on over to the time listed here if FF10 is near the top of your backlog list. Well, first off, Olympus Coliseum, yeah yeah yeah. Let me just get the spoilery part out of the way so we can all be on the same page. This is how you work a Final Fantasy character into a Disney world. I know we set the precedent in KH1 with Cloud, like plopping an FF guy into Olympus, and I was a fan of that too, but this is the good stuff right here. Allow me to introduce Orin. Are you familiar with his work? He's a perennial badass and he needs only one arm to ruin your day and steal your girl. He's gonna spit his moonshine on your grave and then fly away on his Bushido tornado of death. And here's the real kicker, he's also Bruce Willis. He was dead the entire time. He was killed and decided he didn't feel like dying because he hated bullshit so much he would not leave Spira until said bullshit was thoroughly mollywopped. Ignoring how fucking awesome that is, because again, this video is actually about Kingdom Hearts 2, the series has never done a better job than Orin in the underworld when it comes to Disney and Square Synergy. Why do I like it so much? Because it needs to be these two things. If it's Zidane, or Bartz, or Kamari, or Leon in the Underworld, it doesn't work. Likewise, if it's Orin, but in Beast Castle, or Land of Dragons, or Space Paranoids, or Halloween Town, it doesn't work. But Orin in the Underworld, it's this perfect chocolate and peanut butter moment. It's what this series was made for, and I wish was attempted on at least an occasional basis as opposed to like once per game, if that. But to harken back to being supremely ungrateful for being granted new life after death, Orin would also like a slice of that. We actually get to see Orin's recreation in the real time, and I guess we're to assume that this is all happening after the events of FF10, after Orin accepts his death at the end of that game, and we're just seeing him in his younger form here. And of course, I know these games do not share universes, this is obviously just a new and different take on the character, and he doesn't share continuity with his FF10 self, but you know, just go with it, we're having fun. Anyway, he's brought back to life and he's immediately right back to being a badass who has zero tolerance for bossy authority figures. Okay, that ends the Orin portion of my presentation because I'm about 500 words in and I haven't touched on anything else here yet. So I should say, when I decided I was going to do this list, I did not expect Olympus to end up this high. But the more I thought about and looked at it, the more I recognized that it does a lot of stuff that I like, Orin related stuff included. Regarding the world itself, Olympus Coliseum has a better 3 game arc than Kyrie. That should be a controversial statement, but Kyrie has been done so dirty 
movie for so much of this series that I feel like it's actually a pretty cold take. But forget character arcs, let's talk world arcs. Olympus Colosseum is the beneficiary of the most natural and satisfying world arc in the series. We're bringing post KH2 stuff into the discussion at this point, but even without it, the underworld is such a natural expansion to what we got in KH1. Because all things considered, Hercules is a pretty diverse movie, at least as far as its environments go. It's a lot of ground to cover if you're trying to encompass the entire film into one world. Kingdom Hearts, for whatever reason, decided it was going to use this property a lot, and so it delivers a new and unique facet of the movie each time you stop by. The titular Colosseum in Cage 1, the Underworld in 2, and Mount Olympus in 3. Even Birth by Sleep gives you the town near Thebes, whatever that's worth. Like, it only took us 17 years to see everything the Hercules world has to offer, and yet I never felt ripped off in any of the games for being deprived of a large chunk of the source material, because each one takes care to give a lot of time, attention, and depth to whatever part of the source material it is showing you in that particular game. And unlike a Christmas Town, which while charming and nice to see, and also a natural expansion to a returning world, the underworld consists of more than just a few rooms. In fact, by the end of your first visit, only one of the rooms in Olympus Coliseum isn't the underworld, so you're really given an entirely new environment to play in this go-around. And that environment is, like, straight-up oppressive, especially that first visit. The enemies and bosses in the underworld aren't particularly any more or less dangerous than anywhere else, but the negation of drive forms early on in this world adds a bit of an edge to the place and hammers home the idea that this is not where you belong. You're on the Lord of the Dead's terms here. And speak of the devil, in fact somewhat literally, I'm a big fan of the Hades chase sequence on your first trip. It's the most helpless Cage 2 ever makes you feel, which I find especially memorable, fun, and refreshing in a game where you're usually a whirling dervish of death and destruction. Sora's not quite as useless here as he was when he lost his Keyblade in Hollow Bastion, but even then, he didn't have an invincible death god chasing after him and blocking his progression. It's like a legitimately anxious sequence, even if it's not that difficult to get through. But when else in this game are you forced to literally run away from an enemy like an actual little baby as he slings fiery projectiles at you? Speaking of little babies, why is Cerberus so small in this game? Is Hades not feeding him? Also, I meant to bring this up in part 1, but I'm a fan of when the game gives you some one-on-one -on -one time with the world-specific party member. I forgot to mention a Land of Dragons, but I like when Sora and Mulan have to fight off the cave heartless on their own. A small failing on Cage 1's part is that you never really had to use any of your non-Donald and Goofy party members, save for your brief stints with Tarzan and Beast, and you're actually incentivized to keep Donald and Goofy around in case you have to do any trinities. Cage 2 remedies this by adding these very stylish limit attacks that you can perform with each party member to encourage you to use them while in each world, and I also appreciate these isolated moments when the game has you facing a challenge with just the world-specific party member, like here with Orin and Cerberus. But forget Cerberus, dude, because the new hotness around these parts is the Hydra. After some consideration, I think this is one of my favorite bosses in the game. Not even because it's like mind-blowing or super fun to play, although I do think it is pretty fun. But it just does a lot of cool shit. Well, first off, it's intimidating. Like how Cerberus was at the end of Olympus in Cage 1, the Hydra is just massive and genuinely kind of spooky looking. But we also get to take the strategy and lore of fighting the Hydra from the movie, and you know, Greek mythology, and apply it to the game. The game could have just played it straight and had you mindlessly beat the shit out of any of the seven Hydra heads, but nah, you start out with one, you decapitate it and move on to three, and then all seven. It's just really cool. In addition, basically every friendly character in this world gets to participate in the battle in some way or another, so it really feels like a team effort to take down this gigantic beast. And then there are consequences and lasting damage done to the environment because of the battle. Like, that's entirely new. I felt like I lost a piece of my childhood when the Colosseum got destroyed. Especially because I'm actually not a huge fan of the Underdrome tournaments, as I've stated in my KH1 vs 2 video, but thankfully there's more to the world than just the cups in this game, so it's not a huge deal. But you know what is huge? Olympus. Like, maybe not physically, but I feel like this first trip is just massive. You got Phil's dumbass Urn minigame, the Hades chase, Cerberus, the Demix encounter, Pete and the Heartless in the Lock, and the Hydra. That's just like an unprecedented amount of shit to get done in one world, and a Disney one at that. And not every battle or sequence is a home run, but I appreciate just how much is packed into this world, especially considering some of it could have easily been saved for the second visit. There's also just a lot going on, between not just doing the movie plot and all of the players trying to make moves here, between Hades and Pete and Demix. And yeah, Demix, I've never really understood what he's doing here or why it's him in this instance, but small points for injecting a little bit of intrigue with him Roxas baiting Sora here. Pete is doing another dumbass turn X into a heartless plan, which I totally forgot was his goal with this world until I reviewed the Olympus scenes, although I don't know why I'm surprised. Hades actually somehow forgot about what the Keyblade is capable of, or maybe just wasn't paying attention a year ago, because he has to ask Pete, of all people, for clarification on it. Yeah, actually, the villain efforts here are kind of a mess, but I do admire the chaos of it all. I've been pretty positive about the world, but it's kind of reminiscent of my thoughts on Cage 1 Monstro, and that I really couldn't care less about the actual level design or the environments, but the world succeeds in other areas. The underworld itself, at least in my eyes, kind of suffers from Cage 1 Atlantica Syndrome, and that everything kind of looks the same, and there aren't a ton of recognizable set pieces to work with. Once you've seen one 
one room in the underworld, you've pretty much seen all of them. Dark, foggy caves and floaty soul things, that's pretty much the gist of it. I do like the one room that's kind of twisty and purposefully labyrinthian, since it's not something that KH2 typically goes for with his room layouts, and I'd rather have something like that than another room where I can see the door to the next room while standing at the door I just came in through. We've spent an unexpectedly long amount of time here, so let me just briefly touch on the second trip. I'm not a huge fan of what they do with Orin on the second visit, because it's really just a retread of Cloud in KH1. Although, whereas Cloud was just kinda gullible, Orin is literally brainwashed, so at least that's kinda new. But it's ultimately just a different means to the same end, which is Hades using the Final Fantasy guy to try to get to Hercules. They even go through the same contract negotiation, where both guys argue that they shouldn't have to fight Sora, Donald, and Goofy, just Hercules. Also, I haven't given the movie a watch in a few years, but is the whole Hades voodoo doll thing just created for this world. I think it's kind of weird and out of nowhere, but it's a fun idea having to like pull off this heist and retrieve the Orin figure to free him from Hades' control. I will say, and I know I poked fun at this in part one, but emo Hercules on the second visit is a lot more tolerable than the Simba thing. We're contending with the consequences of what happened in the last visit, and it's not really rehashing or going through the same motions with a character for a second time. This is new territory for Hercules, and it's a fun effort trying to get him back into the swing of things. And also, Orin would have totally killed him if we didn't step in. That's canon as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, yeah, I was pleasantly surprised with Olympus after I reviewed everything and took some time to think about its strong suits. It was definitely the sleeper world out of this batch, and it would have been a real contender for the best Disney world in the game, if not for some frankly unfair competition. Got it memorized? If we're talking most charming world in Cage 2, Timeless River is number one with a bullet. You know, it's weird, I just spent like an hour on Olympus, but even though I have Timeless River one spot higher, I feel like I've got nowhere near as much to say because it's all just kind of obvious. It doesn't take a genius, nor does it even take a me, to point out how Timeless River oozes charm and personality. The throwback models for Donald and Goofy and a reimagining of Sora as a 1920s cartoon character, the muffled sound design, the back and forth with Pete and his past self, it's all just a really fun time. The world is physically one of the smallest, and it's the only one visit Disney World in the game, but Timeless River doesn't really need a second trip. It's short, sweet, and to the point. I found myself thinking about the thought process behind Timeless River, and I find it likely that they really wanted to do an old-timey Steamboat Willie world, and then created the whole Maleficent time travel castle takeover plot in order to justify having it. Because like Space Paranoids, it wouldn't make sense to fly to a planet inhabited by a bunch of older versions of characters that the gang already knows, so making the river a subworld within Disney Castle was a smart way to make it work. Again, as for Maleficent's motivations, like, like, what are you fucking around with Disney Castle for, girl? From the flashback cutscenes we get here, it looks like you've got a perfectly usable home base in Hall of Bastion. Whatever, Maleficent's a dumbass in this game. I digress. She did manage to somehow make me feel kind of bad for Pete. We see that he started out as a kind of cranky, but generally well-meaning guy, but I guess going back in time to beat the shit out of yourself probably goes a long way in harming your self-esteem. Yeah, let's not even get into the paradoxes opened up here. Young Xehanor, eat your heart out. This is the original KH time travel chicanery. While everything happening here regarding time travel is obviously of much lower stakes and consequence, it is about 20 times easier to accept and comprehend the rules behind this, at least compared to what we'd get later in the series. It also paves the way for one of the most clever scenes in the game, which is already funny on first viewing, but takes on a double meaning the second time you watch it. Speaking of clever, it should be noted that this isn't strictly a Steamboat Willy world. I mean, that's what the majority of the environments here represent, but it's really a world based on all of the old-timey Disney shorts. But how do you make a world based on those when all the shorts took place in different spaces and didn't really share any continuity? Well, that's simple. You just design a world that takes place in different spaces that don't really share any continuity. Those windows on Cornerstone Hill that lead into the little vignettes are a genius way of representing the disconnected stories from the Disney shorts of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. I know I'm kind of stating the obvious here again, but sometimes if an idea is good and charming enough, it doesn't necessarily need a truckload of nuance or explanation behind it. If it works, it works. Again, there isn't a ton to say here, the place just speaks for itself. For God's sake, look at Sora's old-timey cartoon face, you can hear the hum of a film projector in the background. 90% of Cage 2's charm budget was funneled directly into Timeless River. As I stated in Part 1, Kingdom Hearts kind of serves as a Disney museum of sorts, so at some point they had to have a world based on where all of the magic started. The backbone of an unstoppable, all-consuming megacorporation. The cornerstone, if you will. Get it memorized! So it probably comes as no surprise that my top three Cage 2 worlds are all original creations. As I've said many times in many videos speckled about my channel, I think this game is at its best when you're at the most extreme parts of its timeline. The very beginning, the very end, and the very middle. On any given day, I could have any of these three at number one, so really don't fret too much on the placement here. They're all incredibly close, and they're all leagues ahead of everything else we've talked about so far. 
On this given day, at number 3, I'm going to slot in the artist formerly known as Hollow Bastion, Radiant Garden. Now, for me, it's hard to beat the Hollow Bastion of KH1, topping that world's degree of intrigue, atmosphere, and mystique is a monumental task. Although, maybe Radiant Garden isn't trying to one-up its first appearance. One way KH2 helps raise the stakes and make you feel excited for the journey to come is by plopping you into the late-game penultimate dungeon from the first installment and telling you, this is where you start this adventure. That scary castle filled with some of the most gnarly Heartless from last time, that's your home base now. It's kind of unique, I can't really think of another game that employs a late game location as an early game base of operations in the sequel, so maybe this feeling of relative safety and familiarity was always going to lose out to the Hollow Bastion of 2002 and the newer, fresher worlds introduced in this game, but that doesn't mean Radiant Garden is a stable and predictable environment, far from it. Indeed, this world truly marks the middle point of the Kingdom Hearts story. I know there are more games on the post Cage 2 side than the pre Cage 2 side now, but this is really where the literal and figurative game is changed entirely. You want to talk turning points? Here's your turning point. For the player with access to a Game Boy Advance, Chain of Memories had already shown us that the Kingdom Hearts universe was wider than we first knew, but due to how that game ends, such players had been sitting on a pile of dramatic irony as they entered Cage 2. The second visit to Radiant Garden is where our heroes realize how little they had actually accomplished, how much more there was to be done, and how many more games were going to be released. Sora is placed in a pretty brilliant Cash 22 once the organization's plot is explained to him. Everything he had done a year ago to stop the villains of the first game was pretty much playing into the hands of the villains in the second game. Things are starting to get complicated. The Heartless want you and everyone you know dead. They can't be negotiated with. But nobody's, particularly the ones wearing coats, can be. They're just, unfortunately for Sora, much better negotiators than him. Abstain from killing Heartless and risk the destruction of the worlds and their inhabitants, or continue killing them and help the organization reach their Kickstarter goal. Now, the actual dilemma is admittedly much more interesting than the solution, which is basically just Sora saying, well, fine, I'll just kill all of you before it can matter. But in the real time, it was like a genuine moment of despair that we hadn't really seen from Sora since KH1. It's good to have a moment where our hero doubts himself and his past actions, even if he does get over it relatively quickly. And I don't know about you guys, but I really felt it in the moment. It's obviously no coincidence that the game just threw literally 1,000 Heartless at you and then just drops this bomb on you a few minutes later. You're coming off of feeling like this unstoppable badass, overcoming a numbers disadvantage that would make Leonidas blush, and then Saix is like, thanks so much for the 1,000 retweets, we are now that much closer to our next milestone. Here's a thermos with Xemnas' face on it. Hashtag Org13 Strong. I felt like Ralphie in A Christmas Story when he found out the secret Ovaltine message was just a crummy commercial. Son of a bitch! I've been totally had! It's just some solid story and gameplay integration. In case you'd forgotten just how many Heartless you had killed over these last two games, we're just gonna put a big round number on this batch so you can really feel the weight of Sora's, and by extension, your actions. I could do a whole video on just the post-Space Paranoid section of Radiant Garden up till when the game spits you out into the world map. This chunk of the game is just pure, unadulterated, chaotic energy. Do you remember in KH1 that moment in Traverse Town when Leon and Yuffie are explaining the Keyblade to Sora and then the soldiers invade and shit just kinda gets crazy for a few seconds? This Radiant Garden sequence is like that little moment of chaos stretched out and amplified times 100. There's so many key players, so many clashing allegiances, and so much momentum behind the entire sequence. Admittedly, the craziness is brought to a bit of a lull during the Final Mix exclusive scenes with Xemnas, Zigbar, and Zexion, that was a lot of Zs, but those still dump a crazy amount of lore on us, which helps set the foundations for the games to come. But outside of those few scenes, it's non-stop action. You got SDG, you got Maleficent and Pete, and they want to mess with SDG, but the nobodies are taking their ass, so their attention is divided. Final Fantasy characters are running all over the goddamn place, trading one-liners, kicking ass, and taking names. The Gullwings pop up and join in, because sure, why not? A Stitch of Lilo and fame? Yeah, fuck it, throw him in too. Axel's waiting in the wings for the right moment to further his betrayal. Syax is trying to keep tabs on him. Got a brief appearance by Xemnas. He's just checking in, making sure everything's ship shape. Oh, Goofy's dead. Demix is back. Mickey just did a line. Se Sephiroth, hi. How are you? This is actually not a great time. On first playthrough, I knew that I was basically obligated to replay this game just so I could see all these cutscenes again. And next time, I would be sure to make a save right before everything kicks off so I could hop back in and relive all of it whenever I wanted. There's only so much commentary and insight I can add to the actual gameplay portions of this whole marathon of mayhem. Like, I have nothing wise or interesting to say about the parts when you team up with all the Final Fantasy characters beyond WOW SO COOL because it is indeed WOW SO COOL. The 1000 Heartless battle is just the stuff of legends. It nearly broke the game, like Nomura considered cutting it because it was just such an ordeal to program. We have come such a long way from beating Waka with a stick. In fact, hearkening back to those one-on-one -on -one Destiny Islands duels, you know you gotta take out 999 Heartless and have a final honorable face-off with the last armored soldier. 
or just kill him with magic from afar like a coward. Speaking of cowards, I guess Demix apparently isn't one. No, he's like the disc one boss. Anyone I knew who played Cage 2 as a kid always seemed to struggle immensely with Demix, myself included on my first playthrough. For me, it was the first time the game gave me a considerable amount of trouble, which only further drove home the point that shit was starting to get real. Of course, most of my quote-unquote deaths were from failing to complete Demix's arbitrary task, causing Sora to just fold his arms indefinitely, but still. You gotta have an infamous, notorious boss battle every now and then to keep players on their toes. Besides, you get to take all of that pent-up frustration and release it on hundreds and hundreds of flimsy mooks just a few minutes later. A fitting reward if there ever was one. And I've gotta say, this part of the game is so good it even makes Maleficent look not super pathetic. Like, she's still obviously overshadowed by the organization here, but at least she gets to do something and throw a wrench into things. It's basically impossible to do the Cage 2 halftime show the justice it deserves, so I'll just cut myself short here. We'd be burying the lead to not talk about it first, so let me move on to some other aspects of the world. Well, sort of tying into the mid-game events, we get to see Radiant Garden gradually become more and more accessible, which is something we haven't really seen since Traverse Town, but it's done to a much more noticeable degree here. Your very first trip to Radiant Garden is short and rather limited. You're confined to four rooms, and that's including Merlin's house. On your return trip, prior to starting Space Paranoids 1, the Bailey opens up, and now you've got access to the underbelly of the Bastion itself, all the way up to Ansem's lab. And finally, after wrapping up your first Space Paranoids visit, all hell has broken loose outside, and the rest of the world is effectively unlocked all the way down to the Dark Depths. I think a world just feels so much more alive and interesting to explore when it actually changes throughout the game, and it was something I hoped we'd get out of Cage 3 Twilight Town, but sadly those moments never came. And by the way, when I said that the rest of the world is opened up for exploration during all of that chaos, that includes the Cavern of Remembrance. Speaking on the atmosphere of this place, the cavern is the most reminiscent of the Hollow Bastion that we're more familiar with, complete with the vicious Heartless and strange contraptions and obstacles. I don't think it's a stretch for me to suggest that the cavern is the best piece of physical level design in the game, and it's really not even close. I'd be repeating myself to go super in-depth with it now, but you can check out the evolution of motion if you want to hear a bit more about my thoughts on it. Regardless, it's just an injection of platforming, exploration, and ability application that I always felt Cage 2 sorely needed, so it's a very welcome addition, courtesy of Final Mix. While I think Radiant Garden doesn't quite meet that at-home feeling that Traverse Town imparted as its home-based predecessor, you'll still be spending a lot of time here, especially if you're playing the aforementioned Final Mix. There may not be as many reasons to return periodically throughout the game, like to shop or unlock new treasures, but Radiant Garden is essentially the most bustling post-game location in the series, home to the Cavern of Remembrance and 14 considerably difficult boss battles that are sure to have you clocking in hours upon hours on your save file. On top of that, the world also serves as a nexus for the 100 Acre Wood and Space Paranoid, so there really is just a ton packed into this place. Overall, it was nice that we got to return to arguably the most iconic location from the first game and see what the Restoration Committee had accomplished in their effort to restore the town to its former glory. Getting to see more of the place beyond the decrepit and corrupted castle helped me foster an appreciation for the loss that the Final Fantasy crew experienced in the first game. Above all else, Radiant Garden will always hold a special place in my gaming memories as the backdrop to one of the first truly epic battles I had ever seen in a video game. Get it memorized. Alright, so what's it gonna be? The very beginning or the very end? Again, it's practically a coin flip to me. I do get the feeling that I have a bit of a non-conventional ordering having Radiant Garden where I do, and that's gonna keep up here if my feeling is correct. At number two is the edgiest world of all, the world that never was. Which, yes, spoilers means I have that long and boring prologue world as number one. We'll get there. So here we've got the yin to end of the world yang. As I referenced in my analysis on KH1's finale, both of these worlds are the most linear ones in their respective games. Aside from the world terminus in 1 and the proof of existence in 2, you never have to enter the same room twice. You're just chugging along, either chasing Ansem into the deepest, darkest part of the swirling mass of chaos that is end of the world, or storming a massive, towering fortress to confront Xemnas at the top of the castle that never was. And although I typically enjoy those interconnected spaces more, the context of what we're doing in both of these worlds works in favor of the level design and progression. You show up to both of these final gauntlets knowing exactly what your goal is and who you're after. You're gonna cut through whatever's in your path to catch your mark. You don't necessarily have that kind of foreknowledge when you arrive in something like a Halloween town, so linearity doesn't serve that type of world as well. And again, to reiterate, linearity does not automatically make something bad in my estimation, but I do think it's employed more successfully in some spots than others. The world that never was is more architecturally and thematically similar to Cage 1 Hollow Bastion in both its imposing castle setting and its delivery of meaty plot developments, but this time all of these moments are part of the grand finale instead of the penultimate dungeon. As we climb up the castle, we're finally rewarded with answers to questions we've had for the entire game, long-awaited reunions, and the catharsis of finally finishing off the group of baddies who have been antagonizing our heroes for the past two games. Really three games if you count Xemnas and Cage one final mix. This guy has been messing with Sora and keeping tabs on him since the very beginning. And you know, no one ever talks about how Xemnas is kind of insane. He talks to the moon, and he's in a group with someone who's powered by moon juice. Like, hey bud, it's, it's not talking back. 
I know Syax lets out a Kingdom Hearts Where Is My Heart after you beat him, but if I were killed by a key boy and cartoon icons from my childhood, maybe I'm a bit loopy and saying one-liners to inanimate objects too. But Xemnas is just trying to have full-on conversations with the thing. It's like the closest thing we see in this series to a sort of religious fanaticism. He's fully consumed by this motivation to see his plans come to fruition, and this obsession really drives home what the game has been telling you about nobodies. He really couldn't care less that you just slaughtered the remainder of his coalition. He pays it literally not one second of his time. Speaking of that slaughter, those battles serve as the major set pieces and milestones for this world. It's just no nonsense from the second you step into the Dark City all the way up to the top of the Altar of Knot. Which, by the way, every single room name in this world is also the name of an edgy Tumblr blog from 2009. Welcome to XX Blood Tears XX's Havocs Divide. You have now entered Rar Girl XD's Hall of Empty Melodies. But yes, the world that never was is a straight up marathon, a buffet of boss fights and plot heavy cutscenes, which is for some reason cool and fun in this game, but lame and bad pacing in KH3. Uh, nope, the games have always done this. It's tradition, it's grandiose, it moves at a breakneck pace, and by my estimation, it's always a really fun time. If you don't like how one of the mainline games handles its finale, boss rushes, I would be surprised to learn that you do like how another entry does it, but that's none of my business. Anyway, Final Mix does well to add a Roxas fight, triggered when you enter the very same area where he was defeated by Riku a few weeks prior. Which, a uh, bit of revisionist history on Roxas's part here, he says he defeated Riku, but last I checked, uh, you don't take the final score halfway through the match. Riku didn't hear no bell. Also, Donald tells us shortly after that no one could defeat Riku. What are you talking about? We defeated Riku, you were there! Regardless, framing the Roxas battle as an intense inner struggle was really cool and pretty much the only conceivable way to make this boss fight make sense, so I'm glad they added this in. I guess to the outside observer, Sora is just kind of standing there drooling with his head tilted to the side as Donald and Goofy fight for their lives, but on the inside, he's facing off against one of the toughest storyline bosses in the game. Sometimes we're just our own worst enemies. After Roxas's metaphorical defeat, we move on to pick off the Straggler, starting with Zigbar, who is totally just a surfer dude with no stakes in any of this. As he did in Radiant Garden half a game ago, Uncle Ziggy teases us with some more foundational material for future games. What does he mean by the others? This line was the basis for about 50 game facts posts per day back in 2006. And once again, points for Zigbar's boss fight shaking up the environment and adding an extra element to deal with. I don't have as much to say on the Luxord and Syax boss fights which employ their own gimmicks and special meters but are relatively straightforward. I always thought Luxord was put in a weird spot in this game. I think in hindsight we can say that he's potentially more important than we initially thought, but back in the day he seemed kind of out of place being left alive for this long. I wouldn't have thought about it twice if we took him out on the second Port Royal visit, but he's the third to last man standing for some reason. Syax, however, makes perfect sense as the last line of defense between the heroes and Xemnas, and getting to finally see his facade completely crack makes all of those scenes where he's calm and collected a bit more interesting on the replay. At this point, it finally makes sense why he's associated with the nobodies called Berserkers. Of course, in between all of these battles are the reunions and reveals we've been waiting for, and I've long held the opinion that the delivery of emotional payoffs is one of this series' strongest suits. This world is the first time we see Sora, Riku, and Kairi back together since the last game, and the first time they've all been able to have a conversation since they were sitting on a tree in Destiny Islands. On top of that, the promise of KH1 Monstro is finally fulfilled and we get Riku as a party member. Bro, this had me so hyped as a kid. I really had no reason to believe that we would get a non-Donald or Goofy party member here. If anything, I thought maybe Mickey would have been the candidate here. But halfway through the world, after Ansem's big dorky machine blows up and blasts the darkness out of Riku, dude, the boys are back in town. Giving Riku the extra quirks of the Dark Aura and Dark Shield commands really helps emphasize a feeling of synergy between him and Sora. On top of that, their limit attack is just nuts. It's just like another thing that came straight from my third grade notebook. Just this overpowered, flashy plethora of swords and energy blasts and light and darkness. Like, again, remember when we were just beating the shit out of each other with wooden swords? Sometimes you just have to take a minute to marvel at how powerful these characters have become over the course of their journeys. The aforementioned Ansem the Wise meets his supposed end here, and it's a little character arc I've always appreciated, even if it turns out his sacrifice is a as final as it appears in this game. There's a bit of a consistent thread throughout the series of an older generation recognizing their flaws and short-sightedness and leaving the world to the younger generation urging them not to make the same mistakes. It's a message that always hits pretty hard with me, and in this case I wish life would imitate art a bit more often, but I digress. I miss the organization's unfurling, of course Maleficent and Pete have to show up one last time. I'll admit, they're actually kind of fun here once you finally just accept that Maleficent's motivation in this game essentially boils down to locating some nice real estate. Pete makes an odd Gone with the Wind reference, and the duo just decides, hey, you know what, let's just keep being kind of heroic for a little while longer. I know they're just doing it so Maleficent can have a cool new apartment, but still, I appreciate the initiative and the effort to unite against the common enemy. 
Much like End of the World in the first game, the final final boss rush here is absolutely relentless, starting off with a callback battle against Xemnas at Memory Skyscraper, scratching that cage one secret ending itch, and culminating in a series of increasingly spectacular fights in Xemnas' weird Kingdom Hearts pocket dimension. I'm glad the game lets Donald and Goofy participate in the battle a little bit before blocking them out. It might seem a bit strange to end the game without the trio, but as Riku references, their last adventure ended with them on opposite sides of the door after butting heads for the entirety of that journey. This time, they're fully aligned and facing what lies beyond the other side of the door together. It's a great full circle moment, and if you really want an SDG finale, you've still got 1 and 3 to satisfy that need. I do wish the game didn't immediately shaft Mickey and Kyrie, letting them into the door for all of 5 seconds before pushing them back out. I don't know, they could have been like assisting characters for just the first phase, like something like a Hercules or the Final Fantasy crew from earlier in the game. Nonetheless, Sora once again gets to show off just how powerful he's become in these battles, slicing buildings in half, launching them like softballs into Xemnas' big dragony monstrosity, and parkouring and super jumping all over the place. Although the early portions of Xemnas' last stand in the world of chaos that Ansem created in the first outing, I much prefer the true final battle against Xemnas here, which feels much more satisfying and is overall a more difficult fight. Flying around and contending with a giant ship is fun and all in both games, but I like how in this game we're ending on pretty equal footing, everyone's in the same weight class, and there aren't really any gimmicks getting in the way. Unless, of course, you count that brutal barrage of lasers, which is so insane and over the top, you just can't help but love it. In addition to serving as a more than satisfying ending to one of the franchise's biggest adventures to date, the world that never was is oozing that same mysterious atmosphere that I've lauded so many Cage 1 locations for in the past. The Dark City was always especially fascinating to me because it raised the question, what exactly is this place? Do people live in these buildings, or maybe they did, but they've long since been abandoned? This futuristic cityscape environment is a far cry from the cozy hamlets and almost crude by comparison islands of KH1. Just another way to illustrate our progress over time, even the environments are becoming more and more technologically advanced. Just like with the city, we've been teased with scenes of the castle itself throughout the game, whether it's scenes of the surviving organization members meeting in Where Nothing Gathers, or flashbacks to Zexion and Zigbar talking in Twilight's view. Getting to finally explore the place feels super fulfilling. My favorite room in the castle is the Proof of Existence, which essentially serves as both a graveyard and as a nexus to the organization members' bedrooms. Or at least that's how I always contextualized it. The room always struck a chord with me as just an open, physically apparent acknowledgement that these characters are no longer living, which obviously no longer holds as much weight, but at the time it was kind of a spooky thing to see. It also just provoked my young imagination to run wild, speculating on where all the other members' portals would lead, or what the hell happened as Zexion Zexion's epitaph and what his weapon was. Bear in mind Recom wasn't out yet and there was no Zexion battle at this point in the series, so nobody really knew what he fought with and I'm guessing the devs weren't 100% sure either. I'm glad we got to see more of these characters and their day-to-day -day life inside the castle later on in 358 over 2 days, because the atmosphere of the world it never was is just too engrossing for only one game. We've got it memorized, Axel. Good. And so the list ends where the game begins. You know, there are all sorts of Kingdom Hearts fans out there, some who love one game and hate the next, loathe some characters and obsess over others. You've got your Birth by Sleep revisionists, your Days Defenders, your KH1 Truthers, your Devout Cult of the Almighty 2FM, but this is all small potatoes. The real argument starter, the true line that divides, is the KH2 prologue. Two types of people in this world, guys. Those who like Roxas, and those who agreed with the IGN guy who said he's a garbage character that nobody cares about. Boy, that went over well. Twilight Town at number 1 may come as a bit of a surprise. I have read and watched content from people who are bigger KH2 fans than I am, people who call it their favorite even, but still express a distaste for the first few hours of the game. And I won't try and pretend that I don't understand where they're coming from. It's long, it's not exactly action-packed, it's confusing even for the people who play Chain of Memories. I still remember putting the disc into my PS2, watching the Sanctuary cinematic, and thinking, oh that's nice, they kind of recap Chain of Memories here for the people who couldn't play it. Luckily, I know everything that happens in that game, so I'm fully prepared. And then two minutes later, I'm like, what the fuck? Who is this? Is that the BHK? What happened? Was there another game in between Com and 2 that I missed? Is Sora dead? And I remember being frustrated at first. We're dropped in this place with these four goobers, and I'm like, come on, what is this? Where's Sora? What is this stolen word nonsense? How many days is this gonna be? But I don't know, guys, it, it just grew on me. Kind of in the same way where my five-year-old self just wanted to get to the Disney stuff in Cage one but gradually cultivated an appreciation for the original characters, I found my impatience here being slowly but surely tempered and replaced with a genuine interest in Roxas's plight. And I know it's subjective, and I know it's not for everyone, so I don't fault anyone for still being a bit bored or underwhelmed by it. But right from the jump, I was immediately drawn into Twilight Town ever since it popped up out of nowhere in Chain of Memories. From the moment the card was in Sora's hands, this place was brimming with intrigue. How could this be happening? All of these worlds have been places we went to in the first game. Not even Sora remembers anything about it, so so what gives? And as I collected room cards to progress through Twilight Town in that game, theories were swirling around in my head, none of which were correct. Is this place some kind of alternate or past version of a Destiny Islands or a Traverse Town? Did Sora actually grow up here and he just forgot about it or he had his memories replaced? The mystery behind the location and the aesthetic of the permanent Twilight setting gave me a head start on my 
appreciation for Twilight Town in this game. Throw in that soothing background music and you've got a perfect mixture of coziness and mystique. And as you guys can probably tell by now, I'm a big atmosphere guy. You can pack any level in any game with extravagant light shows and plot twists and epic battles, but if it doesn't feel special, if it doesn't really strike me in a deeper way, it's not going to reach that upper echelon of video game memories for me. And for the record, all of these top three worlds do that, but Twilight Town just has that X factor for me. In addition to being what I think is the best looking world, I also think Twilight Town has the best physical layout. I've made it no secret that I typically prefer the physical level designs in Cage 1 over 2s, and so part of the reason why I have such an affinity for Twilight Town is because its layout most reminds me of a Cage 1 world. It's big, it's got stuff to jump on, you can actually kind of explore a bit, and the rooms are a good deal more interconnected than any other world in the game. Obviously, population-wise, it's a far cry from the sliver of Twilight Town we'd get in Cage 3, but this kind of design just makes a place feel more lived in and believable. I believe that people live here and own businesses and look forward to struggle tournaments or beach vacations. I could imagine a place like this in real life. Of course, I'm not saying a Kingdom Hearts world can't be good if it's not quote-unquote realistic, but the game is definitely trying to sell Twilight Town as all of those things I've described, and its design helps me buy it. I don't really buy that Radiant Garden is or even was a bustling community as we see it in Cage 2. I know it's still in the process of rebuilding, but I don't see this as a place that can support a large amount of people, and I think the game wants me to believe that. It could be the relative lack of NPCs in conjunction with a layout that's still kind of simple and pretty much boils down to a straight line that forks off at the Bailey into two more straight lines. But Twilight Town is a town. You can take different paths to get to the same destination. Tram Common has a bunch of different entrances and exits. You can cut through the sand lot to get back to the safe point at the usual spot, or you can go up through Station Heights to get to the alleyway. The place is huge. You think you've seen all there is, and then the gang's school project takes you to the Sunset Terrace, which is like a whole other half of the town. And you can take a train to get there, or you can travel through the underground concourse. And then you've got a hole in the wall that leads you through the woods to another area to explore in the mansion. And that's not to mention that the world eventually branches off into the mysterious tower and the world it never was. It's just massive by KH2 standards, and no other world in the game comes close to being as fun to explore and just hang out in. Regarding your time spent as specifically Roxas in this world, here's where I come down on it. The prologue really shines on the replay. The first time around, I definitely felt myself getting more invested as the story became less about stolen photos and Setzer and more about Axel and Naminé and existential dread, but at the same time, it's purposefully confusing. You're not meant to fully get all of it yet. How would you realistically surmise that you're in a simulated town the entire time until it's laid out for you? Like, I know we see the glitchy effects in the dreams and the restoration percentage thing in between the days, but whose first reaction to that is, oh, this is a fake simulation of an actual world. I remember on my first playthrough, I definitely felt sad for Roxas when he rejoined with Sora because I had grown a bit of an attachment to him and the life he had in his supposed home with his supposed friends, but it's hard to feel too bummed about it when you finally get control of the hero you really know and love from the first two games. But I think on the replay, both after beating 2 and experiencing 358, everything hits so much harder. You have a firmer grasp on the stakes and the histories behind specifically Roxas and Axel, and the moments that were purposefully confusing on your first time now feel less frustrating and more clever. Or at least they did for me. And I'm obviously not brave breaking any ground here when I say a mystery is less confusing when you experience it the second time, but it's the one world in KH2 that you can experience with two pretty dramatically different perspectives depending on whether or not you've beaten the game already. There wasn't a world in KH1 or any other world in this game that purposefully obfuscates certain characters' motivations or, you know, reasons for existing. Regardless of whether you're viewing the world through the lens of an initial or repeat playthrough, I think the prologue always stuck with me because it's like the first true tale of tragedy in the series. And I mean, sad things have certainly happened in the previous games and they would certainly happen again, but Roxas's week in the simulated Twilight Town just felt complete, even without a full understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. Like, Riku Replica and Naminé got a pretty raw deal in Calm, but we didn't spend quite as much time with them as we do with Roxas, who goes from doing odd jobs and dealing with schoolyard bullies to a legitimate existential breakdown within the span of a few days. It's a total corruption of innocence. We're watching a character who we've only ever known to be good and kind-hearted be told that he should not exist and has no choice but to give up his autonomy and basically his life. The ending of Cage 2 helps soften the blow a bit, but the weight of this moment in the pod room is never fully lifted until the end of Cage 3. And brief aside, I'm just now realizing that Dusk signals the end of Twilight just as the appearance of the Dusk Nobodies signals the end of Roxas's time in Twilight Town. Maybe that's a stretch, but I am choosing to believe it. But yeah, for about 14 years, this was the end of Roxas's story. It was cruel, it was senseless, it was unfair, and it's the first time the series says to one of its characters, sorry, but you drew the short straw. For most children, the end of summer vacation signals a time calling for more responsibility and maturity. For Roxas, it's really not all too different. And due to this tragedy being set against one of the most beautiful backdrops this series has seen, Twilight Town carries a melancholy for me that is, as of yet, unparalleled. Hey, thanks so much for watching, everyone. Uh, how did I do? Did I did I mess it all up? Did I just do it all wrong? Uh, oops, sorry. 
If I somehow managed to hold your attention for this long, consider appeasing me with an upwards thumb, and if you're new around these parts, click subscribe so I can bother you sometime in the future. Again, sorry this has taken so long to get out, it's been something of a hurdle for me, clearly. I do have a couple of ideas for future videos that I'm pretty excited about, including a project dedicated to a game in this series that I have not yet given any substantial attention to on this channel, so I hope to be getting that out next. Uh, I've been asked a few times if I'll be ranking the KH3 worlds, and I definitely anticipate doing so at some point, but I do want to take a break from this type of project for a bit, and I may or may not end up doing rankings for Birth by Sleep and Dream Drop before then, so it is a bit far off. However, if you are for some reason super tolerant of my voice and really want to know my thoughts on KH3 worlds right now, then uh, boy have I got the video for you. A few weeks after KH3's release and a few months prior to the creation of this channel, I recorded a nearly three and a half hour deep dive podcast with my often mentioned friend and partner in KH Crime, Interlight Productions, aka Kiwi, aka The Suspicious Pax East. So I'll link that here if you're so inclined to check that out. I think it basically serves as a rough, if very drawn out version of what a world ranking would look like, and the actual exercise of ordering the worlds is not super important to me, it's more so just a vehicle for me to talk about the games, which is really what that podcast is. A uh, few disclaimers, this was in the immediate aftermath of 3's release amidst a lot of negative public opinion of the game, so we may or may not be a tad bit zesty about some things, and both of us have certainly changed our minds on certain aspects of the game in the 16 months since recording it. I also recommend bumping the speed up to at least 1.5 so you can still salvage the rest of your day. Uh, I'm sorry for ending both parts of this project on kind of a dejected note, but um, considering he'd made a few cameos in my videos and a couple of you guys have commented on him, I figured I should mention that I did have to say goodbye to my cat Zeus a few days after I uploaded part one. He lived a great and long life though, um, I had him since the fifth grade, and some of my earliest memories of him include playing Cage 2 as he sat in my lap, so we'll dedicate this little project to him. Thanks for the memory, Zeus, and again, thank you all for watching. Thank you, my boy.